The next thing is the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. Now we're switching gears. The mitochondria and the chloroplasts, the interesting thing about that one is that there's a theory that states that the mitochondria and the chloroplast used to be bacteria. And that theory is called endosymbiosis or the endosymbiont theory. The endosymbiont theory. Another word for that is endosymbiosis, S-I-S instead of the N-T. Now, nobody was there to see this happen. Here it is, endosymbiosis tutorial. You can click on that. Nobody was there to see it happen because this event occurred or happened to the ancestral cell. The ancestral eukaryotic cell, the first eukaryotic cell that came to be lived among bacteria because it was a bacterial world before we came on the scene. There were bacteria at that time that were photosynthetic and there were ones that were not photosynthetic. They, were, they all had the ability to make energy because all cells have to make ATP. But some of them are also, and the key word is also photosynthetic. So this cell lived among photosynthetic bacteria and non-photosynthetic bacteria. And they were very good at making energy, very good at doing it, better than the, the ancestral cell could do it. Now, I always like to make it like a story, as if I was there. I mean, I'm old, but I'm not that old, right? We're, this we're talking about billions of years ago there. So what happened was, presumably, again, this is a theory, is that the initial ancestral cell says, I'm so jealous of that bacteria how come I can't make as much ATP as this bacterium can? So let me do this. Hey, you, bacteria, yeah, what do you want? Come inside here, live inside. I'll give you everything you want. I'll give you the food that you want, the water that you want, the nutrients, everything that you want, the temperature. Just do one thing, what? Make energy for me. That bacteria said, oh, what a great deal. Free rent, free food, free everything. Yeah, all I have to do is make ATP? Yeah, well, I'm doing that anyways. Okay, I'll do it. So the initial or original bacterium was engulfed into this ancestral cell and took on the role of a mitochondria. Over time, it became specialized. It became your mitochondria. Now, some of you may look at me like, yeah, yeah, sure. Hang on, I'll show you some evidence or supporting facts. So, all animal life came from this cell, including you. Then a little later, that same cell says, you know what? If I did it one time, I can do it again. But this time, I'm gonna say, hey, you, for the synthetic bacteria, yeah, what do you want? Come in here, I'll give you everything you want. Just make sugar for me. Because the photosynthetic bacterium, what was it making? Of course it was making energy because all living cells need energy. But more specifically, this one was also making glucose, sugar, because it's photosynthetic. Fast forward many, 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 many years, what did this one become? The chloroplast. So this one produced all photosynthetic eukaryotic cells, which is basically plants and algae. So all plant life and algae came from this. And all animal cells like you and I and non-photosynthetic eukaryotic organisms came from this one. Now you may say, again, this is a theory called endosymbiosis. You may say, ah, oh, come on, I don't believe that. I don't, okay, that's fine. Well then, let's look inside the mitochondria and see what's happening in there. 
the mitochondria is the power plant of your cell. If you equate all these cell organelles to things that you have in your city, this is the power plant. This is what's making energy for you. And without energy, where would you be? Six feet under. You're done. It doesn't work. Well, it's the same thing with your cell phone. Let me take the battery out of your cell phone and see what you get. You got nothing. You can't send emails. You can't look at your pictures. You can't do anything with it because it's useless. So without energy, the cell is useless too. And this is the power plant of your cell. It makes ATP. And that's why chapter nine is a nightmare for some students. Chapter nine is cellular respiration. It's how the mitochondria makes that ATP. And it's involved, but we'll get there together. Okay, so now we know the function. Now we have to look at the structure of the mitochondria. We notice something. The mitochondria doesn't, is not just a single membrane organelle. It's actually two membranes. It's like having two coats on. So the mitochondria has two membranes, not one. And the other important fact, uh, they're not trying to be cute with this picture. And the inner membrane is folded. That's actually critical for your life. If I flatten this membrane, I'll kill you. So I am not gonna do that to you. So that fold, again, they're not just trying to look, make it look cute. That fold is actually important for your life. And we'll talk about that in chapter nine. So you need to know that the inner membrane of the mitochondria has folds called cristae. The other ones, were the cisternae, those are sacs. These are more like folds, cristae. Now, if you look inside the mitochondria, you're gonna notice something. Hang on, what are those dots? Those are ribosomes. Those are ribosomes. And if we compare this ribosome with your other ribosome, which is outside in your cytoplasm and in your rough ER, we're gonna notice something. They're different. Listen to this carefully, please. The ribosomes attached to your rough ER, attached to the outer surface of your nucleus, free floating in your cytoplasm. Those have the size of ADS ribosomes. Their size is ATS. Don't worry about what the S is. That would take me half an hour to explain that to you. It's just their size. This one, it does the same exact job, protein synthesis, but they have the size of 70S. So with, this, with respect to size, they're not the same ribosomes. Now the question is, where did they come from? I, I, it used to be bacteria. Do you remember that? I just said that. Your mitochondria used to be bacteria. Now listen to this. When I go and look at the ribosomes in bacteria, guess what their size is? 70S. That's one fact that supports endosymbiosis. Now again, endosymbiosis, no one was there when that happened. But how do you explain that your mitochondria has ribosomes that are exactly the same as bacteria? One possible explanation is that's where they came from. And that's where what they were, they were bacteria. And that's the theory of, what's the name of that theory? Endosymbiosis. Endosymbiosis. I asked my micro students and some were able to give that to me, some were not. I can't have that with you guys. When you come to my micro, I hope you're gonna tell, give me that with relative ease, because we talk about it. Here's another fact that supports the theory of endosymbiosis. If you look closely, there's a circular piece of DNA inside your mitochondria. Circular piece of DNA. It looks like a rubber band. But if we look at your DNA in the nucleus, they look like shoelaces. They're linear. So they're obviously different. Your, the DNA in your nucleus are, is linear. We call those chromosomes. 
This one is also can be called a chromosome, but it's circular. Where did that come from? What do you think? Bacteria. Because when we look inside bacteria, no surprise, they have circular DNA. The DNA in bacteria is circular, and that's why the DNA in here is circular, because the mitochondria used to be bacteria. The name of that theory is? Endosymbiosis. Endosymbiosis. Repetition. You have to repeat things to retain things. So, I just gave you two pieces of evidence that support the theory of endosymbiosis. Here's an additional one, just to give it to you for free for the future when you go to micro. When these guys go multiply, they multiply like bacteria multiplies by a process called binary fission. And we'll talk about binary fission later in chapter 12. But that's an additional piece of evidence an additional support to the theory. Binary fission. They multiply just like bacteria multiplies because they were bacteria. Now if we look at the chloroplast, if the theory is correct, then we should see similar things in the chloroplast. That would be a good hypothesis. Well, let's look at it. The chloroplast has two membranes just like the mitochondria does. The only difference is the inner membrane of this one is not necessarily folded. So you don't have to worry about that. The chloroplast has structures in there that plays a role in photosynthesis. Each sac is called a thylakoid. Each stack is called a gradum. So the sac, S-A-C, is a thylakoid. And the stack is a granum. They look like pancakes on a plate. So each pancake is a thylakoid, but the, the stack of them is the granum. And it, you know, we put syrup on our pancake. So there's fluid filled space in here, and that's called the stroma. That's like the syrup on the pancake. See, analogies work beautifully here. But let's go back to that endosymbiosis. If the chloroplast came from bacteria, I'm expecting it to have 70S ribosomes, just like the mitochondria. Well, look, they have 70S ribosomes. I'm also expecting it to have what kind of DNA? Circular DNA. Well, look, it does have circular DNA because it was a photosynthetic bacterium. And when you eventually go to micro, if that's your next stop, you're gonna hear about six other facts or supporting evidence of endosymbiosis. But for this class, it's enough to know that endosymbiosis, the theory of endosymbiosis is supported by the fact that your mitochondria and the plant's chloroplast has 70S ribosome, and it has circular DNA, just like bacteria. The function of the chloroplast is to do photosynthesis. They capture light energy, and they trap it in glucose, and that's photosynthesis. We say plants feed the world. Well, they feed themselves first, and then they feed the rest. Makes sense. I have to survive first to, to, to be able to feed everybody else. So the plant will feed itself first and then will feed the world. And that's called photosynthesis. It is also called chapter 10. And that's another handful. See, the interesting thing about chapter nine is we're gonna see it later. The reaction goes this way. Chapter 10 is the reaction going this way. So if I tell you this, if you don't understand chapter nine, you're gonna have trouble with chapter 10. So I have to make sure you understand nine before I flip it on you in photosynthesis. And those chapters are coming, believe it or not, because we're right now, we're on chapter six. 
Okay, the last structure that we're going to talk about real quick is something called the peroxy.